Hey all, welcome to Share Trek. This is Raj here and friends. Um, uh, the Saturday has been really good. I'm looking forward to my Sunday. I'm recording this on Saturday night around 8.45 p.m. And uh, top of my mind, I'm uh, thinking about Michael Mathoff, who is going to go off on a vacation to Iceland. And he has promised to send us some uh, good videos from there. I'll definitely put it on the channel. I generally like to take pleasure from other people's travels because I personally am not able to travel as much because of all my commitments out here. But hopefully in the next two or three years, I'll be able to uh, travel the world while I still can. Uh, I'm hoping for, I'm looking forward to that. And um, today, friends, I'm going to talk to you about a topic um, that is very important for genomic uh, investors. I'm going to be talking to you about the FDA uh, approval process for gene therapies. Uh, and it's going to be a very comprehensive um, uh, overview. Uh, it's not only going to talk about all the way up to approval, but also beyond approval. And the reason I'm doing this uh, is because every genomic investor need to understand the costs that go into coming up with a therapy. And each of our genomic companies has got multiple uh, therapies in the pipeline for approval by FDA. And every step of this is costing time, uh, labor, and money. And all of those things are important for us in valuation of a company. And also next time when you hear an earning call for one of our genomic companies and they say that they are applied for IND or BLA or they say that uh, they are uh, looking for priority review, you will understand exactly what it means. So I hope you have the patience to go through this entire video. If not, put a bookmark on it so that whenever you are looking for understanding a particular milestone, you can come to this video and have a look at it. Though I may not put an index right now, but in the due course, I'll try to revisit this video and put an index for each stage. So with that said, let's get started. Welcome back, friends. The FDA uh, approval process for gene therapies typically involves several key milestones. Here is a step-by-step -step explanation. I've tried to keep it brief, but at the same time, giving you sufficient information so that it's useful. The first step is the preclinical research. Before a gene therapy can enter human clinical trials, extensive preclinical research is conducted in the laboratory and on animals. This research aims to establish the therapy's safety and efficacy, providing initial evidence for potential human use so that the FDA can uh, decide whether to allow the therapy to be tested on humans. The next step is investigational new drug uh, application. Uh, in this particular step, the gene therapy developer submits an IND application to the FDA. The IND includes um, detailed data from the preclinical studies along with the proposed plans for human clinical trials. The FDA reviews the application and assesses the safety and suitability of the therapy for testing in humans. This is the second gate. And then the next step is phase one clinical trial. If the FDA approves the IND, phase one uh, clinical trials can begin. And uh, these trials uh, involve a small number of healthy volunteers or individuals with the targeted disease. The primary objective of phase one trial is always to evaluate the gene therapy safety profile, dosage levels, and potential side effects. So basically, they want to make sure that patients don't get any adverse effects. If there are adverse effects, they may decide to stop or suspend the uh, trial and ask for changes to be made before it continues further ahead or maybe even totally discontinue. So those things are possible in phase one. If phase one is clear, then the therapy enters the phase two clinical trial. And uh, in the phase two uh, clinical trial, they are now looking, uh, if we go back to phase one, phase one, uh, if the phase one trials demonstrate uh, promising safety results on humans, then the gene therapy proceeds to the phase two trial. These trials involve a larger number of uh, participants, typically including individuals affected by the specific disease the therapy, uh, that the therapy aims to treat. The focus of phase two trial is uh, not only to assess the safety further, but also to look at the eff effectiveness uh, of the, the therapy. And uh, that's the thing that happens in phase two. And FDA is also trying to see that uh, any uh, therapy that is approved uh, is more effective than anything else that is already in the market. And if not, it's as, at least as effective as something else that is in the market for the same ailment. So that's what happens in phase two. 
And if phase two is successful, typically in most of the cases, you go for a biologics license application or BLA submission. Uh, following successful phase two uh, trials, the gene therapy developer can prepare and submit a BLA to FDA. The BLA contains comprehensive data on the therapy, including the results from preclinical studies, phase one and phase two clinical trials. The application also includes information on the manufacturing process, quality control and proposed uh, labeling. And uh, there is also a stage called priority review uh, once the BLA is received uh, and uh, the FDA determines whether that gene therapy qualifies for priority review and there are various criteria that the FDA has uh, in order to allow the priority review for any given uh, therapy and priority review expedites the uh, review timeline. Uh, this designation is usually granted to therapies that address uh, unmet uh, medical needs or offer significant advancement in treatment for some rare disease or uh, ailment. Uh, for example, uh, we had uh, priority review vouchers for Bluebird uh, when they were dealing with um, uh, Skysona and uh, Zinteglo which they later on sold for $100 million and $98 million respectively. So they had two priority vouchers, priority review vouchers. So those possibilities are there. It's possible to have clinical trials that go beyond phase two because uh, there may be some situations where the FDA wants more uh, clinical trial data. And uh, even phase three trials are uh, not um, unseen. So you could have phase 2A and phase 2B and then phase 3A and phase 3B. So those possibilities are also there uh, because um, FDA may want extra information before being confident to approve the therapy. Phase 2B trials are sometimes conducted to further evaluate the safety and efficacy of the treatment or to optimize dosing regimens or patient selection criterion. Uh, these trials may involve a larger number of participants than phase two trials and provide additional data on the therapy's effectiveness and potential side effects. Phase 3B trials, on the other hand, are often performed after phase three trials uh, and are designed to gather additional information about a therapy's safety, efficacy, or optimal use in a specific patient population. These trials can be used to explore specific subgroups, uh, assess long-term effects, or compare the therapy to existing treatments. Uh, the decision to conduct phase 2A, 2B or phase 3B trials depends on various factors, including the nature of the therapy, the disease being targeted, and the regulatory requirements. These additional studies can help uh, refine the understanding of the therapy's benefits and risks before seeking FDA uh, approval. And then we have the FDA review. Once the BLA is uh, submitted, the FDA reviews all the data provided. The review process involves evaluating the therapy's safety, effectiveness, manufacturing quality, because the, um, uh, the company has to, the applicant has to supply all information about the whole manufacturing process. And um, also they have to submit proposed labeling. The FDA may request uh, additional in information or clarification from the gene therapy developer during this stage. The FDA review process is not always uh, done in-house. While the FDA has its own team of expert reviewers who assess the data and make recommendations, they also collaborate with external expert and advisory committees for additional input and expertise, and this happens many times. And uh, during the review process, the FDA may consult various scientific and medical experts, including physicians, statisticians, pharmacologists, and toxicologists to ensure a comprehensive evaluation of the data has taken place. These experts provide their insights and recommendations based on their specific area of expertise. Additionally, the FDA may convene uh, advisory committees which uh, consist of uh, external experts in the relevant field to obtain independent and objective input on specific therapies or issues. These advisory committees uh, review the data discuss the benefit and risk of the therapy and provide recommendations to the FDA. The involvement of external experts and advisory committees helps to ensure that the FDA's decision-making process is thorough, rigorous, and objective. It allows for a broader range of uh, perspectives and expertise to be considered in the review and approval process and brings fresh information from outside the FDA uh, to enrich the whole approval process. FDA approval decision is the next step after that, and based on the review of the BLA, the FDA makes a decision regarding approval. If the agency determines that the gene therapy meets the necessary standards of safety and efficacy, 
It grants approval for marketing and distribution. The FDA may also specify post-marketing surveillance uh, requirement uh, to monitor long-term safety and assess any potential side effects. It's important to note that this process can vary on a case-by-case -case basis and the FDA has the flexibility to expedite certain steps, particularly for therapies targeting serious or life-threatening conditions for which currently there are no uh, therapies available. This is the overall lay of land for FDA approval process. After the FDA approves therapies, several important steps follow. The first of those uh, post-approval is uh, post-approval manufacturing. The therapy's manufacturer continues production to ensure an adequate supply of the approved therapy is available for distribution. And then there is post-marketing surveillance. The FDA may require the therapy's manufacturer to conduct post-marketing surveillance or studies to monitor the therapy's long-term uh, safety, efficacy, and potential side effects in a larger patient population. Uh, and this is always very beneficial. And there are many times that the uh, FDA may change the labeling advice or the FDA may recall uh, a, a therapy or it may come up with some extra conditions. So those things can happen uh, due to the, uh, the surveillance that is done uh, post-approval. Labeling and packaging. The FDA works very closely with the therapies manufacturers to finalize the product labeling, including prescribing information, instructions for use, warnings, precautions, and the potential adverse reactions. And the packaging and labeling must comply with the FDA regulation. And then we have distribution and availability. Once the therapy is approved and the labeling is finalized, it can be distributed and made available to healthcare providers and patients for appropriate use. And finally, we have the continued regulatory oversight. The FDA continues to regulate the approved therapy to ensure ongoing compliance with safety and quality standards. The manufacturer is required to re report any adverse events or side effects associated with the therapy to FDA. Uh, updates and labeling changes may also happen uh, during the lifetime of the uh, therapy. If new information becomes available or changes are necessary, the therapist manufacturer may propose updates to the labeling, including additional warnings, precautions, or changes to the approved uh, instra indications. The FDA reviews and approves these uh, proposed changes. Uh, then we have this uh, very interesting concept of generic or biosimilar competition, uh, where and when it's available. Depending on the type of therapy, generic versions or biosimilar products may be developed and approved after the initial uh, therapy's approval. This allows for increased competition and potentially uh, lowers cost for uh, patients. It's important to note that the FDA's oversight and regulatory authority continue after the therapy is approved. The agency continuously monitors the safety and effectiveness of uh, approved therapies and takes appropriate action, such as uh, issuing safety uh, communications, recalls, or label updates if new concerns or risks emerge in any of the therapies that it has approved in the past and which it continues to monitor going forward. Furthermore, the approved therapy may undergo further clinical research and development, including studies for new indications uh, dosage forms or patient populations. The manufacturer may also seek additional approvals in other uh, countries if they uh, intend to market the therapy globally. So those things do happen. And finding new uses for the same therapy extends the patent. So that, uh, that's a frequently uh, occurring uh, uh, phenomenon in many uh, of the pharmaceutical uh, products uh, that go through FDA approval cycle. So friends, this is the overall uh, cycle that any therapy has to go. And if you look at, let us say, for example, uh, CRISPR therapeutics, they got a very broad pipeline and they got partners with whom they are working. So you can imagine the amount of overheads that go into all these activities. And we have to keep these things in mind because they have an impact on the cash runway for the company. And um, when a company decides to uh, put a particular therapy on halt uh, to pick it up later, then even doing that uh, halting process will involve a lot of documentation and uh, uh, a lot of things so that when they want to pick it up again, they can immediately get started with it. Those costs are also there. Uh, stopping costs and restarting costs are also there. So we have to keep all these things in our mind as investors. Uh, even though uh, each of these stage may be of different duration for different uh, gene therapies, uh, understanding that there are these whole set of stages that it has to go through is uh, very important and it gives you a, a better insight into valuing a company. For example, for a difficult to uh, uh, treat a disease like HIV, uh, the, the whole process 
of um, uh, FDA approval uh, might be uh, much more uh, uh, difficult and it could potentially go to 3B as well because there are multiple strains of HIV out there. And if you look at, uh, uh, let us say, uh, Excision Bios EBT 101, uh, it actually um, uh, edits uh, the HIV virus uh, DNA uh, in vivo. And uh, therefore, I am expecting that there is going to be a whole lot of scrutiny on that therapy by FDA during the trial process. So I wouldn't be surprised if it went into uh, 2B or uh, 3B uh, clinical trials. Uh, so those are all the considerations out there. And if the uh, disease target and the uh, gene therapy strategy is relatively simpler, uh, then it could go through very easily in phase one uh, and phase two and then go into BLA and then go directly into the market. The other factor you have to remember also is that FDA is building its own competence in these uh, cutting edge areas. And as it builds competence and as it starts approving more and more gene therapies, they have a familiarity with the whole system and everything goes much more smoothly and much more better. And uh, we also have this issue of uh, autologous and uh, uh, allogenic uh, therapies when it comes to gene therapies. So both of them will have a different levels of scrutiny. Uh, so uh, those wrinkles have to be added on top of this when it comes to gene therapy companies. So friends, I hope you found this uh, useful and uh, uh, this was a serious topic. Uh, you can watch this video more than once in order to look at various areas and uh, get a better understanding of, of the whole cycle. Or you could visit this every once in a while whenever you see a, a quarterly earnings report from any of our genomic companies where they mention any of the milestones. This will give you an idea. I was seriously thinking about pro providing you average duration for each of these phases, but I decided against it because each therapy is different uh, and each um, strategy uh, for uh, testing a therapy is uh, different. It may be superior or it may be inferior. A superior strategy can easily go through phase one, phase two, and into BLA and get approved. But if there is any uh, ambiguity in the strategy or the strategy is not superior, it's a, maybe the strategy is a bit compromised, then there is the scope for having to rework the strategy and start all over again. So those things are also there. So that's all for today, my friends. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, and um, uh, I hope Michael uh, lands in Iceland very soon and we start getting his uh, excellent videos. With that, I'd like to end the video here. Bye for now. Have a great day. I'll see you all on Monday.